comparison, a number that I got simply by finding out what rho is, because I know this splitting is 2.5 millitesla, and I know that the proportionality constant is 0 0.05, which I got from a hydrogen fiber. So what does this mean, 0 0.05? It simply means it is 5% of the total time. So 5% of the total time, this electron actually spent on this hydrogen. 5% on this hydrogen, 5% on this hydrogen, which essentially means it's 15% of the time it spends on hydrogen. And therefore I know that 85% of the time it has to spend on carbon. So almost 85% of the time the radical, methyl radical has its lone electron sitting on carbon and therefore carbon does become an electrophilic center. You can actually work this problem out for many other things. Take the phenyl system. So benzene is again, benzene is a singlet system. All electrons are bent. But if I remove one electron, then I form the phenyl radical. Now the question is, what is the structure of the phenyl radical? Meaning, where is the electron spending its time? How many peaks do I have over here? I mean, how many protons do I have? Six protons. If it is six equivalent protons, how many peaks must I have in NMR? Seven. So, at the same thing, I'm going to have an ESR. I'm going to have seven peaks in the ESR because there are six equivalent protons actually splitting my the, the lone electron. So, the experiment is going to look like. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That's what it looks like because 6 protons will actually give rise to 7 keys. 6 equivalent protons will split my adjacent neighbor in NMR by 7 because the same thing happens here. 6 protons will actually split it by 7. Now, what do I need to find out? And mind you, as long as these are all equivalent, these distances will be the same because they're all constant splitting parameters. So all I do is find out what the splitting is. Once I know what the splitting is, what do I do? Go back to this equation, because I know this. What is R? Got from the hydrogen calibration experiment to be 0.05. Therefore, what do I do? I get rho. And what is this rho going to be? It's going to be the electron density on the nucleus, which is causing the splitting in the first place. Who is causing the splitting in the case of the phenyl radical? The proton is causing the splitting. Therefore, that rho that you get will actually be the electron density on this hydrogen. Once I get that rho, I don't remember the number that is applicable to benzene, but I think it's there in band with this. Take a look at that. Actually, work the problem out. He also has given the problem for naphthalene. I don't intend that you should look for that because naphthalene has got. We will just look at the case of naphthalene, but we won't analyze it in detail. I will give you problem based on the equivalent protons. Find out what the value is. It's going to be at least, I think, 5 times smaller than what you saw. It's 2.5 millitesla, right? So you see it's about 5 times smaller, but 0.5 millitesla, I think, which is what you get here. So if it is 0.5 millitesla, then that goes over here, 0.5 millitesla. R is 0 0.05. You measure what this is, and you will actually find that will be something like 0.9 uh, or there, point, I mean 0.9 percent on each hydrogen. Put together, how much would that be? 0.9 on each hydrogen. There are six hydrogens, so roughly how much would that be? Well, about 5 percent totally, 5 to 5.5 percent. What does that mean? The balance 95 percent or so, or one number, is actually spending on carbon. So even though carbon really don't split the peak, and only hydrogen split the peak, by actually measuring the electron density on the hydrogen and summing them up and knowing that the balance of the time has to be on carbon, I actually get electron density information on carbon, which could actually be very important for me when trying to understand reaction mechanisms. Because that will tell me where the electrophilic center is. And you have studied electrophilic reactions in the case of aromatic compounds, right? And what do you do? You say there's an awkward direction, para direction, meta direction, and so on. You can actually get information with regard to the electron density from such experiments. And this is something that is going to be quite useful. Let's take the case of naphthalene, just to give you uh, an 
the fee for what complexities can happen. Use your knowledge of organic chemistry. How many equivalent protons do I have over here? Are all protons equivalent over here? No. How many sets of protons do I have? Three. Which three? Well, there are no protons over here, man. You have only two, right? Which two? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The color is organic chemistry. Am I using the number in for that? Okay. So, what are the equivalent ones over here? 1, 4, 5, 8 are equivalent. 2, 3, 7, 6 are equivalent. So you do not have two sets of four protons. One set of four protons equivalent among themselves, and another set of four protons equivalent among themselves. So now if I have a natural radical produced, it's quite easy to make. What do you think can happen? Well, the ESR spectrum is simple, or will it be split into substructures? Well, four of them will split and give you how many peaks? Five. And what will the other four do? We'll split each one of them into five, and therefore you will have a pentate of a pentate. So you can see how the spectrum is going to look like. It should be three, four, five, right? And now we actually look at the spectrum. This one here, this peak here, will have five. This will have 5, this will have 5, and so on. So you're going to have a 25 peak spectrum, really. And it's up to you to figure out which of these is one set and which of these are the other set. But then it's, it's possible. And if you do that, you really get information by looking at the two splittings. Splitting over here. This split will tell me something about the coupling between these protons and therefore the electron density information on these protons. And in some structure splitting, will tell me information about, about these guys. I will therefore actually get information on how much the electron actually spins on those hydrogens, 1, 4, 5, 8, and on 2, 3, 7, 6. Integrate them, subtract from 1, they will then tell me how much time it spends on the carbons. Of course, I can't tell you now how much it spends on this carbon and this carbon because the carbon is not spreading. But I can still tell you as to how much time is actually spending on the carbon framework and how much time it is actually spending its time on the hydrogen pairing. And that information is quite possible to get by simply analyzing the spectrum of the ESR spectrum of uh, naphthalene. Now, of course, you can take any radical for that matter. And that's something that's, uh, that's, that's quite popular in, in ESR spectroscopy. You look at radicals, metal complexes, their radicals, and actually get information on where that electron is basically located. Is it located on the metal center or is it located on the ligands and so on? Now these are the information that you really need to understand many of the mechanisms in organometallic chemistry. But ESR actually provides you for that. There are other modifications to ESR where you can actually couple the ESR spectrum and the NMR spectrum and get resolution. This is called double resonance experiments. There are, there are experiments called endor the dynamics polarization experiments, but we do not get into all of that because the only reason I wanted to do this was it would be a real shame if you went away saying I know about NMR, but I haven't learned a thing about ESR. But in actual practice, you can learn most of ESR if you only realize well, that it's pretty much like NMR. And it is that connection that I wanted to bring about in this class, and that's the reason why I wanted the one extra class. Now you see why. So that's so you, so you really have understood ESR, even as I was teaching about NMR, subconsciously you were learning about ESR. And I just wanted to realize that these two are quite related in many ways. Experimental techniques, yes, they are different. One cell stays in the radio frequency region, one stays in the micro region. One gives you sharp peaks, one does not give you sharp peaks. Relaxation mechanisms are different. But then the best way to learn something is always to see what the similarities are, and then go back and see what the differences are. And basically you have understood both techniques to that extent. So, what have I taught you so far is what is going to be there in the exam. What I will do on Friday is basically discuss what I will expect from you in an exam. And uh, because as I said, 
Uh, many of you have been missing out, not because I think you don't even understand the topic, but you're making some very weird errors, and I think that should be stopped. But we are going to discuss many of the pitfalls that I have seen, so that it becomes a lesson for the others. I'll also summarize the whole course, as you see the whole course as one big picture, because we have learned about many different things, and I want to give you some real life examples of how the, the whole uh, picture actually gels, and plus, what I really expect from you as far as the exam is concerned. We will discuss all these things on Friday and close the course on that day. But whatever I've taught you so far, what I will do is send you an assignment today on the spectrum, NMR spectrum. And I will maybe give you a couple of problems and ESR based on these little things that we have seen. So you can work them out. And if you have problems, we still have Thursday, Friday and Saturday to sort these out so that you are well prepared for your exam. I, I, I really hate to see anybody getting an end in the course, but of course, if I have to, I have to. Uh, but uh, you know, help me by not making me give an end. Please. Okay, we'll stop here for a minute.